there's only one problem on the planet, the human being. I think that's an amazing vision. Okay, we are all one, that's not going to help. I personally have been a nomad for about nine and a half years. It seems to be the only way forward for us. If you can wear your body like you wear your clothes. I think that would be amazing. I'm a living evidence. I'm a living proof that it works. We'll think about it. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to visiting in India soon. Well, this is the first time in the history of humanity that this is possible. Namaskaram, Anastasia, and uh, also the young lady with you, Alexandra and Vitalik. Namaskaram. Good to have you with us. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, I am Anastasia, the co-founder of uh, Restate Foundation, and this is Alexandra, uh, another co-founder of Restate Foundation, and we're very happy to have you both uh, in this discussion. What's happening in the world right now is that we have uh, a front row seats to witness the damage we cause to each other and the planet. Preserving the status quo is simply not functional anymore. Civilization will be prompted to change in any case, and the only question is whether it will change by force as a result of a catastrophe or by choice as a result of opening our hearts and minds. Humanity needs alternative ways of existence and coexistence. This is why uh, the Restate Foundation was created. We rethink current systems and steward the transition of humanity to the next level of consciousness. We do so by rethinking our governance and self-organization and making it more transparent, participatory, and at least partially decentralized. We are engaged for that matter in research, technology exploration, and awareness building around the future of governance. Today, uh, we have the technologies at our disposal that could either create phenomenal well-being for everyone or destroy the planet several times over. We run the risk of sabotaging humanity entirely, and I assume all of us uh, would agree that people often make poor decisions while being unaware of what factors influence them. That's why we at Restate Foundation believe that raising the level of consciousness is essential for all of us, for the future of governance, and for the future in general. That's how we can turn not merely into the architects of our own destiny, but into collaborators in the collective destiny of the human race. Restate Foundation is delighted and honored to have a unique and first conversation with Sadhguru, founder of Isha Foundation, and Vitalik Buterin, founder of Ethereum. Well, even though each of you is a leader in your own field, consciousness and technology, it would be good to explore how involved you are in the other field. Sadhguru, as an author of Inner Engineering and the one who experienced the state of dimensionless unity of absolute perfection. Please share your interest and involvement in technology. And Vitalik, as the one who embodies the new era of technology and decentralization, please share what kind of work you do on consciousness, as we all know that you were raised by a very conscious and spiritual father. <laughs> well, uh, you kind of cut me out of technology, but uh, I'm... Uh profoundly involved in technology, because in my experience, this human mechanism is the highest level of technology yet on the planet. Though people are calling some computers as super, I have still not found one which is super, more super than this one. It is just that we were given such a masterpiece of technology, but most people are trying to operate it without even reading the user's manual, so it's one big mess. But uh, it's time we educate them to understand how it functions. If we understand how it functions, how we want to be will be by choice. If how we want to be is by choice, what do you think people will choose, pleasantness or unpleasantness? <laughs> Definitely highest level of pleasantness. So in search of high highest level of pleasantness, well, people drink alcohol, people take drugs, people want to go to heaven, all in search of highest level of pleasantness. But if you understand how this technology functions, you can create the highest level of pleasantness right here. 
I have enough, uh, <laughs> you know, evidence from modern science also. I am a living evidence. I'm a living proof that it works, and there are millions of people who, who, who know that it works. This is a technology which needs to be explored because this is the highest level of technology. And we have gotten this technology after millions of years of research and development, which is all dismissed off with one single word called evolution. Evolution is research and development over millions of years. And here we are. All we're doing is making a mess out of it, causing suffering to ourselves. And once we know how to cause suffering to ourselves, inevitably we will share it with the rest of the world. And you can call it a war, you can call it a famine, you can call it whatever. Essentially, people are sharing their misery. Yeah, I think um, blockchains and um, you know, crypto and Web3 are an uh, interesting field of uh, technology because they... Uh, involve people a lot more than the uh, other technical fields do, right? Like uh, AI, at least, um, you know, the way that AI is, is uh, being envisioned right now is often about the AI doing things by itself. Um, of, uh, other fields are just about, um, you know, small groups of uh, people inventing machines and, um, you know, those machines are doing kind of great things, but uh, in a way where people are not kind of, directly involved except at the end of the process uh, by uh, receiving it. But uh, what's interesting about blockchains is that they are a uh, technology that is about, uh, you know, human coordination and is about uh, helping, um, you know, different uh, groups of people come together uh, to, uh, you know, be able to trust each other more, uh, to uh, collaborate on, across uh, larger distances on uh, many uh, different kinds of projects and the uh, the blockchain space itself i think uh, reflects those values in a lot of way right uh, the uh, people in the space talk to each other often um the the uh, space and uh, i mean especially the uh, ethereum foundation and the ethereum community are very uh, international right so uh, you know in the ethereum foundation we have uh, you know an office in uh, berlin an office in denver one in uh, you know Zug in switzerland one in singapore um you know we have people across uh, the world in you know latin america taipei canada uh, you know uk all kinds of uh, different places and like i personally have been a nomad for about nine and a half years and mm -hmm. um, you know as part of that i've uh, a good fortune to just interact with uh, all of these uh, people and i think uh, just seeing you know what kinds of lives different people have is uh, a, a kind of consciousness um, in itself right it's uh, you know seeing what kinds of different uh, interactions there are between the uh, you know cultures and kind of social technologies um, and um, you know ways of life that people have uh, evolved over you know thousands or hundreds of thousands of years as well as these uh, you know very new tools that are being built very quickly and uh, just you know to see how like what are the different ways in which the yeah, different groups of people uh, relate to those tools and uh, caring about using them um i think is uh, something that's uh, fascinating and you know it's something that the yeah, community yeah, i think uh, you know really yeah, tries to value and uh, get the most out of the one thing uh, that's happening in the world is um, environmentalists are talking about consciousness technology people are talking about consciousness and health care specialists are talking about consciousness. So it's a good thing that consciousness is a new coin of transaction in many ways. But one thing we need to understand is that consciousness can neither be a transaction nor can be a communication. We are misunderstanding the different dimensions of intelligence which is invested in us and which exists in the existence. If you can, uh, <laughs> you know, if I can take a few minutes, please. See, it's like this, we have different dimensions of intelligence. I'll put it in a very simple way, otherwise it'll take too much time, just to put it very simply. One thing is we have a front end of intelligence, which we call as our intellect. If we are given a choice, all of us, I'm asking, would we want a sharp intellect or a blunt one? Vitaly, sharp or blunt? Sharp is better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> sharp, that's everybody's choice. So we have a sharp instrument in the front. If you have a sharp knife in your hand, 
if you want to dissect something, it's very good. But so… but suppose you want to stitch your clothes, then you use a knife. You know, it'll be like the present-day fashion where most people's clothes are torn <laughs> by… by design, not by default or not by use. So, knife can be used in a certain way. It's a fantastic tool for dissection, opening up things and looking at it. But if I want to know you, will I know you by embracing you or will I know you by dissecting you? Which is a fact. If I open you up, I may see your liver, kidney, spleen and whatever else, but <laughs> one thing is I won't know you because you're gone. <laughs> but by including somebody, by embracing somebody, you know something which cannot be known by dissection process. So intellect is a tremendous and a fantastic tool for dissection and which is very important for our survival in this world. There are other aspects of our intelligence, which is one thing is called, in yoga we call it ahankara, which means the identity. Because identity defines how you use the intellect. If you're identified with a race, religion, caste, creed, nationality, whatever else, or gender, the moment you're identified with that, your intellect will do everything to protect that because it's essentially a survival tool. It's... you have been given this knife in the front, front end of us is like a sword. This is a survival tool, without this we will not know how to survive in this world. And this survival tool is used and wielded according to our identity, how we are identified. In this culture, in the yogic culture, always before we initiate a child into education, first thing is we are seeing how to make his identity a cosmic identity. Because right now I, I'm identified with my race or religion or any other sect or group or, na or a nation, then my intelligence and my empowerment of knowledge will all be used to protect that identity. Maybe when it is small, it looks selfish. See, if you fight for yourself, they will say you're selfish. If you fight for your country, you're a great guy, all right? But the end result is same, somebody will die. It's not very different. Actually, if you just fight for yourself, maybe one person will die, either you or him. But if you fight for your country, millions may die, all right? So the problem is just this that we have not dealt with identity properly. Once our identity is in some way limited to any aspect of life, whatever it may be, then our intellect will be against something. We just don't realize this, we think we're doing a great thing. Most people who did the most terrible things on this planet always believed they were doing the most fantastic thing. Many people still believe they are working for God and doing terrible things, all right? So, Identity is with religion, identity is with nationality, community, family, individual self, it doesn't matter what. The moment you have a limited identity, your intelligence or your intellect will function only to defend that identity. So there's another dimension of intelligence, which we call as chitta. When you say consciousness, we're talking about that intelligence, which is the basis of everything in this creation. So that intelligence, which you are referring to as consciousness or we refer to as chitta, to be more specific, is that type of intelligence which does not have an iota of memory, because our memory is the basis of our identity. In which country am I born? This is my country. What gender am I? This is my gender. What community am I? This is my community. This is all by memory. If you just remove the memory, people don't have any identity. Our identities are constructed on the mechanism of memory. So, intellect is one hundred percent dependent upon the memory. If you don't have any memory, this word is no use, only if it has memory. So, what kind of memory? None of us have any universal memory. Our memories are all limited to the places where we are grown up, whatever is the influence around us, this is our memory. We may evolve this memory into a little higher place, but still, memory is a boundary. What I call as my memory, is just a boundary around me. So these two people are in my boundary, in my memory means, oh, they are within my boundary, I know them. Somebody else is not in my memory, that is a stranger because he's not in my memory. So these boundaries are going on, these boundaries are an outcome of an evolutionary process which is a little bit, un you know, left undone.
we still have a reptilian brain where the need for boundaries is still strong within us. So to evolve beyond this is, is possible on this planet only for the human being. And that evolution is called consciousness. This is not an intellectual thought, okay, we are all one, that's not going to help. But when you touch this dimension of intelligence, which we are referring to right now, for the lack of English words, we are calling it consciousness or it's more specific and better to call it as chitta, is an intelligence without memory. If you touch this thing, there is a... <laughs> in a very mischievous way, in the yogic culture, it is said like this, if you touch your chitta, then they say God will become your slave. You make your own meanings out of that, depending on your identities. Interesting. Thank you very much, Sadhguru. Actually, my next question is very related to what you have said, and you have partially answered that already. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share the screen to for you to see uh, the results of the study that we've recently been doing, uh, looking at the last 6,000 years of human civilization. And what we see is an appalling gap that appears between the technological capacity of human beings and our moral development, the development of, for the lack of the better English word, we call consciousness. So I would be curious to, to get your ideas on how you think this gap might be closed in the next decades uh, or years, because it seems to be the only way forward for us um, until we hit the, the brick wall. Uh, and uh, what do you see happening if this gap uh, keeps increasing? Uh, maybe let us start with, with Vitalik. Like Sagaru made a, yeah, a really yeah, important uh, point by yeah, having starting to talk about uh, identity, right? And uh, identity is something that, uh, you know, especially, yeah, you know, in the blockchain space, we yeah, uh, definitely, um, you know, think a lot about and uh, definitely yeah, talk a lot about, right? And a lot of adjacent uh, spaces talk about it a lot. Like, for example, uh, in uh, Radical Exchange, the yeah, you know, group uh, created by uh, Glenn Weil, uh, that, uh, who started with um, you know, quadratic voting and quadratic funding and Harbor Group taxes and these uh, kinds of ideas. Recently, he thinks about identity a lot. And uh, one of uh, his uh, favorite ideas is this uh, concept of uh, intersectional identity. Basically, that... Uh, to the extent that people do see themselves as uh, part of groups, uh, people should not see themselves as being part of one group. Uh, people c c should uh, see themselves as a combination of uh, all of the yeah, different groups that they were part of. And I think, um, you know, he would say that this kind of uh, identity is uh, one that could lead to a yeah, more peaceful world than this uh, kind of single identity approach that we've been doing right because um, you know if uh, if one person from uh, one country um, you know sees a person from another country and they identify uh, themselves only by their countries then uh, they might start fighting but if they yeah, have a broader view of their identities they might realize that you know oh you know actually you know both of us uh, really like cryptocurrency or you know both of us uh, you know have very similar technical interests. I mean, you know, we both uh, have uh, families that actually look look very similar. You know, we're both uh, you know, university students uh, studying, uh, you know, mathematics uh, just uh, two years ago, right? And creating tools that make it easier for people to see these uh, more complicated identities that they have and, um, you know, identifying the commonalities between them is uh, one of the things that uh, he really cares about, right? Um, so, one of the yeah, ways in which I think this you know, divide gets talked about is uh, the difference between uh, kind of social technology um, and uh, purely physical technology. And look, these are not pure categories, right? Like ultimately, every technology is a yeah, social technology in some way. Like if you look at, um, you know, even AI, for example, right? Like uh, the yeah, the way that they that AIs have been. I think thought about in science fiction is as these, um, you know, very inhuman and alien minds that, um, you know, just uh, figure out what they value through kind of pure, um, you know, first principle thinking. 
But in reality, the AIs that we see today are in spot, uh, they're, they're literally trained from, um, you know, billions of uh, units of uh, like work, whether it's art or text or, you know, computer code or other things that have been done and put and put by people onto the internet in the, the uh, last 30 years, right? And, uh, you know, if you talk to GPT, like it, it doesn't look like, it doesn't feel like an alien intelligence. In some ways it feels, you know, almost more like a mirror of humanity, right? And, um, you know, blockchains and some of the uh, things on top of blockchains like uh, DAOs and, for example, they're even more obviously that, right? Like these are tools to help, you know, groups of people organize. Uh, they're tools to help uh, people identify things that they value in common, right? So like Gitcoin grants and uh, quadratic funding might be a good example there, right? It's a, a tool that uh, helps people like basically, yeah, you know, treats donations to projects as a signal of what people value and, um, you know, helps identify things that lots of different people uh, value at the same time. You know, this is uh, what we call public goods and, uh, you know, basically add a kind of even more support to those uh, projects, right? Uh, so these kinds of technologies, I think, uh, can help uh, us build both, you know, more of the kinds of uh, physical technologies that, um, you know, make our lives uh, better, but also if we look at technologies that have a chance of making our lives both e either better or worse, uh, try to kind of pull them in directions where the positive tendencies um, are the ones that kind of get amplified the most and that uh, get the uh, the strongest support and the uh, strongest uh, resources put into them, right? And I think look, these kinds of things are not going to solve every problem, and uh, people are going to you know continue to have uh, disagreements. But if those, you know, if if we can uh, turn the more we can turn agreement in spirit into, um, you know, actual uh, realized cooperation in practice and turn a disagreement in spirit into at best a learning opportunity. But, you know, if it has to be kind of live and let live um, in practice um, instead of uh, active conflict, then that's uh, something that like I think we can benefit from. And I think those are the kinds of ideas that, um, you know, a lot of people in Ethereum and in those, uh, you know, related uh, communities really care about. See, when we say technology, we must understand technology is an application of some things that we have figured out as to how they work. And all technology is an outcome of our intellect. Because we have a certain intellect, we are able to develop these technologies. But till now, at least, the cutting-edge technology, always went into military use. So essentially, if we get any kind of technological tools in our hands, first thing is, we will see how to kill people. Then of course, we will come back and save their lives. So, this is happening because we are unidimensional in exercising our intelligence. Our education system does not in any way even recognize that there are other dimensions of intelligence within the human being. Intellect is the only thing. And uh, even in the intellect, what we regard as highest, when you were in school, Anastasia, what, what did they give you marks for? They gave you marks only for your memory, not for your attention, not for your genius. Nobody gave you marks for your genius. They gave you memory, they gave you marks only for your memory. Now that machines are beginning to have more memory than human beings can imagine, now they are feeling threatened and they are struggling. So I would say instead of... I know, it's, it's a very sweeping statement, please don't think I'm against anything. But if we want real change in the world, because after all our lives are a tiny bit of time, in our time if we want some change, Instead of technologies focusing on replacing economic structures and political structures, if we focus on replacing the education structures, which is the easiest thing to do and most accessible thing, and nobody can control it anyway, if we do that, we would change the world in a much bigger way than trying to change the political and economic structures. 
because there are many, many aspects attached to it, which I don't think everything has been figured out. They have not been figured out. There are many, many aspects attached to it. But in a small way, a very egalitarian economic tool, if it is going like whatever uh, this blockchain technology and other things, even if it uh, represents one or two percent of the world's economy, it could be a good reinforcing mm, rib in the whole thing, so that when something goes wrong, there somebody can fall back. There are nations where their currencies have completely failed and their banks have failed and their... You know, there are nations like that right now in the world. In those nations, people are suffering immensely. In those kind of conditions, if there was a little fallback somewhere else, it would definitely help people. But if we invest technology and all the efforts that we're doing into educational systems and making them universal in nature, not national in nature, I think that would change the world. But we must have dedication and patience to wait and see how the next, next crop of human beings come up with a new sense of the world, with a new sense of this. This is happening in some scale, but it's all happening randomly without any, you know, uh, any kind of... Uh, I know we... I'm not talking about control or curation. I'm just saying there is no direction to it, it's just happening randomly, which is leaving a lot of young people absolutely confused. This confusion leading to a whole lot of... Uh, an unhealthy percentage of mental illnesses, suicides, and all this is rising because young people are confused about fundamental things about life, which we thought we had figured out. <laughs> we wanted to ask if our technology is natural, but it looks like you already answered this question, Sadhguru. If I can say one, one thing about the, what you mentioned just now, is the technology neutral? The question should go further down, is there any human being who is really neutral? There is no human being is neutral because the way you are right now, your very body right now is a body of memory. There's evolutionary memory, there's genetic memory, there is every kind of memory, all right? Conscious, unconscious levels of memory, articulate, inarticulate levels of memory. Every cell in your body carries this. You may not remember how your... Uh, grandparents were ten generations ago. But maybe your gr grandmother's nose is sitting on your face, you know? Uh, your body remembers everything that your forefathers were a million years ago. So who you are right now, you are a product of memory. Whatever is a product of memory cannot be neutral. It has a position. Maybe it's a more open position, but still it has a position. This is why I talked about chitta and consciousness. Only when you transcend memory, there is no such thing as neutrality, but you can be above. If you rise above certain things, then you're not neutral, you're just all-inclusive. And action will be as it is necessary for the given times of the day, because action cannot be some perfect action from somewhere. Action is always relevant to the time in which we exist. Neutrality is uh, an interesting topic, I think, because... Uh... You know, a lot of uh, things in that we uh, have today and that we uh, try today, they uh, do they do strive for you know neutrality of some kind, right? So uh, you know, blockchains they uh, strive to be neutral in the sense of uh, you know not discriminating between uh, transactions coming from different people and uh, being open platforms that accept everyone. Um, international organizations uh, try uh, strive to uh, sometimes accept every country and, um, you know, be a forum for them instead of uh, taking sides. And I think there's uh, there is something important to the yeah, concept of uh, like structures that do not take sides too much, except on like one, uh, some very small and particular things that are their mission. And uh, they try to leave room for people to, and uh, other organizations to cooperate on top of them. Uh, but then at the same time, I think uh, even, you know, in the crypto sp uh, space itself, that definitely uh, started with building these unusual structures from the beginning, also uh, under started to 
understands the value of uh, intention and sometimes even the need to have uh, structures that support opinionated uh, perspectives on different things, right? And um, you know, perspectives are definitely try to be inclusive, but still end up being opinionated. Like even uh, simple questions like, uh, if the yeah, protocol has to change and it has to be upgraded, then uh, you know what is the yeah, upgrade that gets chosen? Um, or if uh, some uh, something like research or development or something else needs to be funded uh, for the yeah, protocol to uh, con continue to exist, then um, you know how do we yeah, choose like who to fund, which which projects to fund out of uh, several different options, and. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of fascinating work on mechanisms like um, quadratic funding to try to make these uh, choices in a uh, more decentralized way that tries to combine everyone's voices instead of only a few people's uh, voices. But you know, even still, like when uh, designing these mechanisms, I think it proves to be impossible to avoid being uh, opinionated to at least uh, some degree, right? And uh, sometimes, you know, being opinionated is good because, um, you know, we do have opinions and, uh, you know, the goal is to try to get away from that. The goal is to try to create combinations that are constructive instead of uh, combinations that are uh, destructive. Uh, Vitalik, uh, I'm uh, an absolute mm -hmm. zero when it comes to... Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a blockhead when it comes to blockchain, okay? So, mm -hmm. you must treat me kindly, but I will say what I have to mm -hmm. say because the way I see it from outside. Mm -hmm. The important thing is uh, human beings, the way they are made, wherever they are, they want to be something more. This something more, if somebody has money, they want more money, in that direction crypto can help. Somebody can have more money by doing a few things, Somebody has knowledge, they want to have more knowledge. Somebody has technology, they want to have more technology. Somebody has love, they want to have more love. Somebody has wealth, they want to have more wealth. But human being is wanting more. What is this more about? How much more will settle? If we make somebody the king or queen of the planet, will they settle? No, they will look at the stars, they will look at the galaxies. So there is something within us which wants to expand in a limitless way. There is something within us which does not like boundaries within ourselves. There is something else within us which is always instilling boundaries because this is a survival instinct. If there is no boundary, you feel terrified. If there is no boundary, you feel there is no definition to who you are and what you are. So boundaries are important for both physical and psychological survival of the human being. At the same time, the human being is longing to expand beyond all limitations. Because how much ever a human being has, they want more. Compared to how much our grandparents had and how much we have today, I think all of us have at least ten to twenty-five times more or maybe much more, unless your grandfather was an Indian Maharaja or something. Okay. <laughs> so, doesn't matter how much we have, this is not going to settle. So once we see that what we are looking for is limitless expansion, we must understand that trying to expand physically is not the point, because physicality is a consequence of boundaries. If there is no boundary, there is no physicality. We call this our body because there is a boundary to this. If there was no boundary to this, this cannot exist physically. So physicality exists only because of a framed boundary. So because our identification and experience of life is so related to our bodies, we look at everything in terms of boundaries, maybe bigger and bigger boundaries, but still boundaries. Nature itself, physical world itself treats us as about, treats us with boundaries. See, we can be on this planet, we can't leave the atmosphere and just walk away, because this is a boundary set for us. Well, we can break it with all kinds of technologies, but there is a boundary. The very nature of creation is, physical creation is boundary, because all physical is only because of defined boundaries. Having said that, technology enhances our 
empowers us to do things that we could not do before. But it is not making us do anything absolutely new. It is only enhancing what we can do. All the machines we have created, all the technologies we have created are enhancement of who already we are. For example, we can walk. Because of that, we have come up with all kinds of mobiles, automobiles, airplanes, this, that, only because we can move. If you were made like trees rooted in one place, we wouldn't have even thought of a bicycle for sure. Now we can see. So we have come up with a telescope, microscope, all kinds of scopes. Now we can speak, so we have microphones, telephones, all kinds of stuff. If you look at it, everything we have done is only an extension of who we already are. We can see this much, that's not good enough. Right now you're in Zambia and the ladies are in uh, Sweden, is it? Dubai. Dubai, okay. That's close, so that's why I'm able to see you. You're just close by <laughs> So, we're able to see you, this was not possible hundred years ago. If you had done this hundred years ago, you could claim that you are a, a messenger of God or son or himself, if you want. If you could just show a picture of what's happening in Dubai or Africa to someone hundred years ago, you would, you know, claim yourself to be anything you want. So, I'm saying technology has extended our sight, our hearing, our sense of everything but it has not done anything new because technology is a consequence of who we are, first of all. So the most important thing is, there are ways to see how to enhance this first. If you enhance this, the kind of technologies that we will evolve and above all, how we use it will change dramatically in the world. So without transforming the human being, we want to transform the world. Well. I don't want to be discouraging, but I've been around for very long, you know. <laughs> Without transforming the human being, you try to transform the situation, it's all temporary. You can teach them any number of values you want, three days they will be all right, fourth day, it'll go on as it goes on. See, after World War II, we said we will never again have another war. Tell me one year has... as any one year, has passed without a single war on this planet. We're still going on. Now we are talking about number three, World War Three. I mean. We're talking about it and we're doing our best to get there also. Everything possible we're doing to get there. It's unfortunate, but this is what happens when you do not transform individual human beings and you enhance their empowerment. This is a natural consequence. We have the United Nations, we had the League of Nations, we have all the principles, everything embedded. What is the morality that we do not know? We know every damn thing. But we will use all that to hit each other anyway, because we are not enhanced. Our abilities are being enhanced, but we are not enhanced. Before our abilities enhance themselves too much, we must be enhanced. We must be in a higher level of being. Our way of being must be at a higher level. Then our ability to do will be a fantastic thing. But when our way of being is reptilian in our head and we are hugely empowered, this is a tragedy we are seeing right now, that science and technology, unfortunately, has become the basis of the unfolding tragedies on this planet. This is the greatest solution. This is the greatest solution that we figured out things in nature, which we call as science, and we have figured out ways of creating applications for our knowledge, which is technology. Both these things must have been the greatest boons, but we are using it to destroy everything, the basis of our existence itself, because we have not taken time to enhance the human beings. We are treating human beings also like products, that can go through an extruder and come out. Everybody is a graduate or a high school or a master's or a PhD, something, everybody falls out of the same extruder and they're all supposed to look the same and feel the same, but it will never happen like that because not a single leaf you will find in this planet, which is exactly the same as the other. This is the nature of creation. If we don't respect that, if we do not stay in tune with that, our empowerments, 
will lead to larger and larger disasters. Disaster not always will come in the form of a bomb. It will come silently. Interesting. Mm. And so are you planning to uh, spread your message using technology like app or, I don't know, any kind of like meditative programs? Uh, or maybe Vitaly can suggest something uh, based on blockchain, how we can spread this very important message to the whole of the world? Uh, one reason I'm here with all of you today is uh, because we are right now building towards... Uh, last year, uh, you must have heard of the Safe Soil Movement, that also came under the banner of uh, Conscious Planet, about creating a conscious planet. Planet is not going to be conscious unless you and me are conscious, all right? It is human business to be conscious, everything else is fine. There's only one problem on the planet, the human being. Why is a human being a problem? The highest level of intelligence, the peak of evolution on this planet, why have we become a problem? Because at this level of intelligence and capability, we are supposed to function consciously, but we are still functioning unconsciously and compulsively. That is the main problem. How to get people beyond their compulsive ways of doing things? Well, Vitalik was talking about how to, you know, break a few barriers of uh, communities and make it multi-community, whatever. Yes, these are all efforts I appreciate. But how to internally do that within the human being? So this is the problem, that we have to attend to every human being. This is not a mass movement. Every human being, we must bring that effort within them to make that happen. Is such a thing possible? Well, this is the first time in the history of humanity that this is possible. Because now, we can talk to almost the entire world, not in some mass gathered in one place, not a crowd, individual people is sitting in their homes, they can be addressed. Never before this was possible. Many great beings have come, but when they spoke, hardly ten people could hear. This is the first time. Tell me how blockchain can take this, we will... we will unroll this in 2024, we will have a global movement for our conscious planet. This is not my moment. This is something that every concerned human being has to come together. I want to make sure every human being is concerned. Because every human being is concerned, it is only a question of scale. Somebody is concerned only about himself. Somebody is concerned about him and his family. Somebody is concerned about him, him and his community. Somebody is concerned about him and his nation. Somebody is concerned about all life on this planet. So I'm only talking about the scale. Anyway, human concern is there. We just have to expand the scale. For that, there has to be a little bigger experience than what we call as body, because right now human experience is limited to physiological and psychological processes, which are all with boundaries. Without boundaries, they cannot function. If human experience rises beyond physiological and psychological processes, naturally the way they look at the world and the way they experience the world will change. I must tell you this, you know, this is almost uh, twenty-eight, twenty-nine years ago, that uh, when I found out that in this part of uh, India, the average green cover in this state was only 16.5 percent. The national aspiration was 33 percent, and uh, some UN agencies came and predicted that in another 25, 30 years time, this part of the India will be... the desertification will happen. I couldn't believe it, all around me is green crops, how will this happen? So I myself drove around all over the place to see if this is for true. Then I found three perennial rivers had gone totally dry, and many other streams which were perennial have all become seasonal, and the major rivers have become seasonal. And uh, as I knew it when I was a child and how it is today, is in a terrible condition. Then I made up this plan and I said, see for this area, I made a simple barefoot calculation and said, if we want to turn this around, we need to plant 114 million trees in the next eight years time. If we do this in 15 to 20 years, we will have 33 percent green cover, and this much water sequestration will happen, this much carbon sequestration will happen, everything can be back as it was at least 50 years ago, if not 500 years ago.
So people roll their eyeballs, 114 million trees, how is that possible, Sadhguru? Then I did one simple thing, I took thousands of people and made them sit outside in open air with trees and made them set up a certain process with which they could actually experience what they exhale, the trees are inhaling, what the trees exhale, they are inhaling. Once they experienced this, once they understood a part of their lungs is hanging out there, Oh, now you can't stop them from planting trees. Eighty-five million trees, living trees, they have planted. In not in eight years, they p did this in some twenty-four years or twenty-three years, because first five, six years I spent planting trees in people's heads. That's the most difficult terrain, believe me. So if that terrain doesn't change, every empowerment, we will use it against each other, one way or the other. We may be well-intentioned. See, most of the most terrible things on the planet has been done with good intentions, not with bad intentions. Most destructive things have been do done with good intentions. So it is very important for us to understand at this level of empowerment that we are in twenty-first century, just good intention and morality will not take us to that place that all of you are dreaming of. It takes consciousness beyond physicality, and psychological aspects of who, who we are. Hmm. I think uh, blockchains can uh, get, uh, help with uh, you know things like organizing communities and helping. We will um, come to you, Vitalik. Uh, people. We will come to you, Vitalik, when we start rolling out the Conscious Planet movement. We want mm -hmm. all the block people to get together. Yes. Absolutely, yeah. I think that I, I I think that would be amazing, um, but uh, you know, I uh, I do think that uh, you know, in this case, uh, you know, technology only only is and only can be one part of the uh, solution, right? Like it's uh, you know, we, it can help uh, br bring people together. It can help create structures for uh, people to come together. But this uh, part aspect of uh, helping. Uh, people you know improve on the inside i think is uh, something that is uh, super important and um, you know that's something that uh, you know blockchains or other technologies you know but cannot do by themselves they can help but i think uh, you know ultimately yeah, the yeah, the biggest part of the yeah, answer has to come from uh, a person themselves. If you think that you're finished school and uh, that you have a license to stop learning that uh, then um, you know, as uh, the uh, as the world keeps changing, and um, you know, as that experience gets further and further away from you, you know, you'll just uh, go back to um, actually, you know, actually, yeah, uh, not knowing very much about the yeah uh, things that are happening. And so, you know, within one, I think that's true uh, for technical education, and I think it's uh, also true for the kind of uh, education that you're talking about and, uh, you know, helping a yeah, person improve, um, you know, like spiritually and um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, being uh, more in touch with uh, with their consciousness um, as well as uh, a uh, helping people, regardless of uh, where they came from, um, you know, continue to understand the, you know, how the you know, latest uh, technologies work, um, you know, uh, regardless of, um, you know, where those technologies are being invented or where they come from. So, Vitalik, uh, what I'm trying to say is, yes, I very much agree with uh, a whole lot of things mm -hmm. that you said. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I'm trying mm -hmm. to say is, see, if we can make human beings sit here and clearly know, experientially, not intellectually, experientially, that you know your body, what you call as your body, is an accumulated process, you gathered it over a period of time. So if you can wear your body like you wear your clothes, that you know you're wearing it and it's okay, it's yours, it's fine, but it cannot be you. Similarly, whatever you have in your mind is also accumulated. What you accumulate can be yours, can never ever be you. So what I'm saying is, I can give you a tool, with which you can sit here and distinctly experience what is me, what is mine, what is me, what is not me, in other words. So your body is here, your mind is here, what is you is little away from that. I have tools like this. If I give a tool like this, okay, do you have a technology to make it reach at least to two to three billion people? 
Because if two to three billion people experience their lives beyond the boundaries of their own bodies and their own psychological structures, you will have a different world and every technology will be a boon then. I, yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I think that's an amazing vision and uh, I definitely hope that we can, you know, both the, uh, yeah, the, the technologies and, um, you know, as just as people, um, you know, we can, uh, work to try to make that happen. Let's make it happen then. <laughs> we'll make sure to follow up. So <laughs> absolutely. be aware of that. Because we had a chance mm. to experience this meditation at Isha Foundation, and that was a mm. really life-changing experience. So I, I really mm. want the whole world uh, would have this experience mm. as well. You're close by, you can just walk across the ocean and be here in India. We'll think about it. Mm. <laughs> No, I you know, I look forward to visiting visiting India soon. Please, please come to the center. It's a very unique place. We are uh, our backyard is over ten thousand square miles of rainforest, and uh, it's an, a spectacularly beautiful place. And the whole space has been clear created meticulously, uh, only to enhance human experience. This does not belong to any philosophy, any ideology, any religion or any kind of dogma dogmatic thing, it is only about creating devices. Actually, somebody who was here, who has been all over the world to all kinds of teachers, he came and uh, stayed here for three weeks and said, Sadhguru, this is a spiritual factory. I said, that's a very good description, I never thought about it that way, because it works for everybody. <laughs> because it's a technology, you just have to learn to use it. It's not a teaching, it's not a philosophy, it's not an ideology, it's not a scripture, it is a technology. You just learn to use it. So, uh, Vitalik and both of you ladies, please, you're most welcome. Please come and make use of this space. It'll be our privilege to have you here as guests. Thank you. We will take Absolutely. you up on yeah. this. And thank, we will... yeah. thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very uh, much. Do you have any more questions uh, to each other or should we continue then maybe in India together? <laughs> we'll continue in India, I think. But if Vitalik has some questions, we can. No, nope. I'll, uh, I'll think of questions and, uh, you know, I will uh, ask them when, when we see you each whole, other again. Bring a whole, whole bag full, okay? Don't come with excess baggage. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you so much for good. the conversation. Thank, thank you. It's a pleasure and a privilege. Thank you, thank you very much. And we will see you later.